knock at the door. My friend is like, you heard that, right? She's like, there was nobody there. Then I hear, this scared me. There's always weird things going on at the house that I was growing up in. The second I put my head to the pillow, I heard a man's voice. Somebody was like kneeling at, at my bed. <laughs> The feeling I got it, immediately that it was a very sad place. I heard this voice. He pointed his staff. He started to come down the stairs, and I thought, I'm in trouble. That night, I wake up. I can see myself from three different perspectives. Knowing that somebody had died, I was living in this ranch house with my boyfriend at the time. His name was Chris. And we lived out in Agora Hills, which is about half an hour outside of Los Angeles. But none of our friends would come see us, and we were kind of isolated out there, and we were both working in Los Angeles. So we decided we wanted to move back to Los Angeles to be closer to everybody. We found this really beautiful old English manor. It was like a big white house. And when I walked in, I just fell in love with it. And I, I wanted, I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. And it was really beautiful. And, and we moved in. And we were walking around the house. When you walk in the bedroom and then just to the left, there's a little sunroom with these little French doors that open into the room. Immediately when I walked into the master bedroom, I felt there was something off. Let's go. It really did just get extremely, just a cold. It's almost like the room is 15 degrees cooler than the rest of the house. And your hair, you know, stands up on your arm and the back of your neck. And it was, it was a little freaky. I chalked it up to, I don't like the vibe in here. The, the, the feng shui is off. We gotta repaint and just change everything up. What we did was we would stay in the guest room and then we completely redid this bedroom. And we got a painter to come and, you know, picked out really bright, you know, airy colors. And I wanted to try to get that vibe out of there. First, you know, major sign where I knew there was something in the house was we were sleeping in the guest room. And this loud banging happened. We jolted awake, and immediately my dog was cowering. And that was a sign of, OK, something is not right. I've never seen him react like that. Like, he was completely cowering. And I'm like, what is going on? And it was so loud that, you know, Chris got his gun. My dog's name is Lambert. He was trying to get Lambert to follow him. Lambert was scared. Whatever it was, freaked him out. He went downstairs, started checking out the house. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I'm gonna just check everything out up here, make sure everything's okay. And my master bedroom is to the right. Walked in and then I saw, sure enough, the sunroom door that was unlatched and banging against the wall. And then I closed it and I latched it again. And I know that I checked it and I know that it was closed. And we were both just like, there might actually be something here. A couple days later, my friend is helping, because Thanksgiving is coming up, my friend's helping me prep all of my vegetables and everything for you know the meal. I'm doing all my preparations for Thanksgiving, which was the next day. And there was a lot going on. We had to finish, you know, getting the room painted and everything and get the house totally done because we're having this big Thanksgiving party. And 
we're hanging out and we hear a knock at the door. And I also hear a woman's voice saying, hello. Huh. And I, I literally was like, oh, there's someone at the door. So my friend went to go get it and I continued chopping and doing my thing. And then she comes back a couple seconds later and she's like, you heard that, right? And I said, yeah. She's like, there was nobody there. And then that's when the radio blasted on. And we're both a little startled because we're like, where is that coming from? And it was coming from upstairs in my master bedroom. I'm like walking toward my master bedroom and I open the door and the music is blasting. So loud. And immediately my attention goes over to the French doors in this sunroom area and right beneath it is my painter's radio. And I walk over to the radio, which I don't really want to do. Turned it off and beelined out of the room as fast as I could. I was like, okay, cool, done, awesome. He has an alarm on his radio and that sucks because it scared me. So the next day, it's, it's Thanksgiving Day and he's, you know, finishing up his stuff. And I go up there and I'm, and I'm talking to him and I'm like, hey, so, you know, last night I was doing some cooking and stuff and the alarm on your radio went off at like eight o'clock at night. And he's like, I don't have an alarm on my radio. He's like, Laura, I think I know why that might've happened. I don't want to freak you out. There's an old woman in your bedroom. And I literally just, I couldn't believe it. I was really scared. I'm pretty, I, I mean, when he told me, I knew he was talking about a ghost. I don't really get scared that easily um, at all, but um, this scared me. It, it did really scare me. Okay, he saw something in there. I know the feeling I, felt when I walked into that room, the radio blasting on, the knock at the door, and I'm like, there's something, this is just not cool. My painter finished our master bedroom, and the house was all set up for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving dinner, everybody starts showing up. All my friends, brand new house, they're all looking around. And <laughs> two of my friends are like, oh, we wanna go check around upstairs. Right when they said that, I got a little pit in my stomach. They were like, we're gonna go check around upstairs. And I was like, uh, cool. I'm like, all right, cool. So they take off upstairs and I'm talking to my guests. You know, offering drinks, handing out hors d'oeuvres. And everyone's just having a really, really great time. Then I hear Everyone's just having a really, really great time. <laughs> then I hear, <laughs> and everybody is just like, what's going on? And I run to the stairs and the two of them come running down the stairs. They're like, oh my God, Laura, you're not gonna believe what we just saw. We walked into your bedroom and we saw an old woman. And I literally like went pale and I'm just like, oh my God. And my friend was like, listen, I'm gonna call my mother. And I'm like, Wait, why are you gonna call your mother? She's like, listen, my mother has experience with this stuff, let me just call her. And meanwhile, I've never experienced anything like this before. So I'm just like, okay, fine, call your mother. And she calls her mother, and her mother's never been to my house before. Her mother's not even in the state. Her mother is in Florida. And she calls her mother and I get on the phone, and she said, okay, I'm gonna need you to go back up to your room. I 
and we walk into the bedroom, and I'm literally standing at the door because I don't really want to go in there. And I'm looking around, and then she says, okay, is there a little room off to the left? And I, my attention goes right to the French doors into the sunroom, and I'm like, yes. And she said, okay, very calm. She's like, okay, she's in there. I saw her, and we're like, oh my God! We scream and just freak out and run out of the room. And I could, this woman has never been to my house before. And my friend did not fill her in on anything. My friend was literally, here's Laura handing me the phone. She didn't know anything. And I run downstairs and then I have her on the phone and she's like, okay, listen, I need you to stay out of that room for half an hour. She's like, do not go up there a second before that. And I look at my watch and I say, okay. And she says, okay, call me back in half an hour. And I said, okay. Hang up the phone, trying to do my best to deal with what's going on. Meanwhile, upstairs, I don't know what's happening. And then half an hour later, it's so funny, the three of us meet at the bottom of the stairs and we're like, okay. We walk up the stairs together. We walk into the master bedroom and it's like, Nothing had ever been there. The vibe is different. It feels cozy. It's so different. Oh my God, finally. The room even looks different. Like, I'm just like, what did she do? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> and it was just awesome. And there was whatever was there was just gone like that. There was never a problem after that. I actually talked to her later and I and I asked her I'm like what what did you do? And she said, "Well, I asked her to leave." And I just said, "Okay. Cool." Because it worked. And that was it. I always believed that there was always uh, always something else out there. I actually grew up in a, in a home that was, uh, that I believed to be haunted. There's always weird things going on at the house that I was growing up in. My parents moved me, uh, me and my sister, to uh, a place in the San Gabriel Valley outside of Los Angeles uh, called Glendora, which is kind of nestled up in the, in the uh, foothills. Family room, living room, swimming pool, dog, pretty normal. I had like the, 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 the front bedroom, which was facing the street. My room was, was, uh, was very small. When he first walked in the room, straight ahead was was uh, my my single bed. You know, I had you know model cars in there, and, and the posters I had in there were not even rock and roll posters. They were like you know um, black light posters. A lot of black light posters in there. Little kids would come over, and my 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 sister would babysit and. And nobody would go into my bedroom at all. I mean, if they, there was a lot of, yeah, like a lot of Hot Wheels and all kinds of that kind of stuff. And but nobody would go in there. Who was kind of scared? People would come over. I remember somebody came over with a baby and. As soon as they went into my room or near it, they, they started crying. And it, it was kind of like a bad vibe room. There was a light inside my closet. I would always turn it off and, and, and shut the door. And I was, would wake up in the middle of the night and my light would be on and the, and the door would be open. It wasn't very big. When you went into it, it went back 
like a little ways. I assumed that that I had just somehow forgotten. You know, I couldn't figure out how I forgot, but I just thought maybe I just forgot. So I would get out of bed, actually go turn the light off, close the door. You know, I just close it to where it was just shut and then go back to sleep. And that's the way it kind of started. After that happened, every night, the second I put my head to the pillow, I would hear just like a complete party going on with people laughing and people cheering each other, music. It wasn't like I woke up listening to it. I turned the lights off, get in bed, and boom, there was sound. And it just it went on and on and on. But the second you lifted your head off of it, you, you couldn't hear anything anymore. It was silent. It got kind of so annoying that I just would try to stay up as late as possible before I would go to bed. So I would be really tired, so I wasn't annoyed by, by all the noises in my room. Until, until like one night, the music was going on in the one ear, and I heard through my other ear a, a mumbling, a, 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 a man's voice. But it was, um, it wasn't really saying anything, but it was there. It was talking to me, but it wasn't, I couldn't really understand what the words were. It sounded like a man's voice. At that point, I was petrified. <laughs> it sounded like somebody was like kneeling at, at my bed and trying to talk to me. It really scared me with the, with the man's voice. Uh, jumped up, I turned the light on, and nothing was there. It was dead silent. I didn't know what was going on. I, I got really scared. I ran in and I told my dad. The door was closed. You know, I banged on the door. My dad is, you know, what are you doing? You know, what's going on? And I said, you know, so there was, a man was talking to me in the, in the room. I think he lives in the closet. My dad took me back in my bedroom and, and looked around, and he was he was he was pissed. <laughs> he was mad at me for waking him up. The next you know night, I tried to to go back to bed, and I'm laying in bed, and it was about three in the morning, <clears throat> and I just I, I I just opened my eyes and and opened my eyes for really no reason. I looked towards the closet. The door was just kind of starting to open. And there was a man's face in, in the doorway. I looked towards the closet. The door was just kind of starting to open. And there was a man's face in, in the doorway. It was an old man, and he was standing, like, staring right at me. You know, it, it had a scraggly beard, but he was kind of dressed, you know, kind of dressed nice, but disheveled, you know, nice pants, and he had on a, like a, like a dress shirt. He had no color, just even, you know, his clothes and, and his face and, and everything were, where everything was gray. That really scared me. I don't think I've ever ran that fast in my life. I, my dad came and checked the closet. There was nobody there. He was, uh, he was not happy with me again. You know, he, my dad, you know, was a working man, and you know, he had to be up at five o'clock in the morning, and you know, I keep running in his room and 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 telling him that there's, you know, I'm hearing people talking, and there's, there's a. There's an old man. My parents didn't believe me, but they just thought I was weird. I didn't go back to the to my bedroom to sleep for at least a few days. I uh, I just slept on the couch in the living room. It scared me that bad where uh, I uh, I just didn't want to go back in the bedroom at all. I didn't want that to happen again. I wanted somebody to I wanted somebody to see him too, or I wanted somebody to 
to experience it. I wanted to know why he was there. I wanted, you know, I had so many questions. My aunt came to visit. This is uh, my mother's sister, uh, my Aunt Nellie, and, and uh, I love her to death. She's a, uh, she tells everybody she's, she's psychic. I didn't really know what, really kind of what that meant. She's just um, very open to everything. You know, like she, her, her mind is completely open. And I think she feels things and sees things that, that, that we don't see. She, she kind of pulled me to side and she said, she said, she said, Vince, you, there's something going on in your bedroom. And I go, yeah, nobody would believe me. She, she just knew. She told me she knew from right when she walked in the house. My mom and dad, they just kind of let, let her do what she wanted to do and kind of humor her. She closed herself in the bedroom for a long time. I, I have no idea what she, what she did back there, but um, she came back and she said that, that uh, um, it was an old man. He didn't mean any harm, but uh, he had died in that bedroom. She said there's a party at the house. And people were having fun, and she described him. And, and she described uh, the fire. The room caught fire. <laughs> it was a party going on at the time that this guy passed away. And I think he just wanted people to know that he had died in, in, uh, in that room. My aunt actually, uh, Started, did a little research on the house, and that was a remodel, uh, remodeled room uh, for with burn damage, or fire damage. And at that time, I was so happy because she, you know, she validated what I had been seeing. I never saw him again, um, but I kept, still kept the the closet door closed and and the lights on. I'm hoping that. Whatever my aunt did behind those doors made him move on. And I like to think that, that, that I, I helped him in some way you know, move on and, uh, and, and go to his, uh, his next destination. I never thought about paranormal or anything like that. For the most part, I didn't believe any of that. When I got a divorce, I had two little babies and um, went looking around for a, a house to live in, and I just couldn't find anything. And then we drove by this house on this beautiful block. My real estate agent said, well, here's the house you should be living in. But uh, I said, how much is it? <laughs> I'm an actress, but not making that much money. And uh, she said, uh, let's go take a look at the house. And it was beautiful. I'd never been in a beautiful home like that. The girls, I wanted that kind of a home for them and thought that maybe someday I'd be able to uh, earn enough to achieve something like that stairway, just winding stairway all the way up. And um, big doors, you know, eight foot, a lot of wood. But it was very subdued. The feeling I got it, immediately that it was a very sad place. And she told me the story that it belonged to the great Olympic champion, Sonia Henney.
I didn't know very much about her. I knew that she was a big movie star because I had seen that movie. It happened in Sun Valley. And she skated and she had stars in her eyes and she was very, very pretty and had so much going for her. She was one of the wealthiest women in the world, by the way. And her husband was the Onassis of Norway. And he was a great gentleman. And um, they never had any children. She died in 57. And the house remained empty for four years since her death. The children ran up the stairs. And they went into her bedroom. And in her bedroom, she had kind of tufted walls and a very, very Norwegian it looked to me. <laughs> My children, of course, tiniest ones went, oh, this is a bedroom for a princess. Mommy, you could sleep here. <laughs> we were getting ready to leave the house. I was getting very nervous because I didn't want to see any more. I just knew that I just couldn't afford this house. I heard this voice. He looked like a Viking that had just stepped off one of those big ships. Mr. Olmsted, who was her husband. I did not know her husband was there. He started to come down the stairs, and I thought, I'm in trouble. And I said, I'm so sorry, sir. Uh, 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 I'll, I'll get them, we'll, we'll, we'll leave. And he said, no, 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 no. In this house, this house was built to be filled with children and laughter and love and family. <laughs> and he pointed his staff at me and he said, you want to buy this house? Oh, I'd love to. But I can't afford your house, sir. And uh, he said, now, how much can you afford? So I thought very quickly and lied, of course. I said, I can pay $17.50 a month. <laughs> and I couldn't. And he said, you'll make it $17.50 and you'll have a deal. And I said, no, 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 I couldn't do that. And he said, yes, you can. You will. And uh, he told the real estate, bring your people over here and, and write this up. She's going to have this house. This is where we still live. When I first moved in, I felt a little spooky a couple of times when I was alone. I heard a lot of walking right above my room, back and forth and back and forth. And I thought, who is that restless spirit up there? So that's how it all started. There was a lot of throwing of stuff in the beginning. Like something fell up in the attic. There were just smatterings of sounds, uh, slamming, windows closing, you know, slamming the window down. You'll hear music coming from there. I, I finally went to investigate. It was very quiet, and it was almost like a death. It was deadly. I can't explain it. Of course, there'd be nothing there. Then it started happening more frequently, more aggressive sound. I'd have a party outside. Lights would go on. People would look up and go, somebody's up there. Then I was startled from a sound sleep. <gasps> and someone was standing over the bed, like I was being stared at. 
then I was startled from a sound sleep. <gasps> and someone was standing over the bed. Like I was being stared at. And then it went away. There was a time where I thought, hmm, am I going to be able to handle this house? A few months later, I was up in the attic. I heard very light and like some light mumbling. So I started to explore this room. On the wall, she had a painted Norwegian fairy tale. It's of a little boy and a little girl, and um, she's skipping, and she has a full dress on, and, and it started at one end, and it went around the room, and I thought, this is beautiful. What, what did she have this for? She had a, probably a good imagination and was childlike herself to have that painted, that fairy tale painted. She could have, that have been the room that she had planned for her own children. In the room, there was this contraption in the middle that was now defunct. She had her own figure skating rink up there that froze. Evidently, it looked like she hadn't used it for a while. So it was something that she used to do. This was uh, her, her sanctuary. And um, I better live up to it. I had, did have that in my imagination. The girls weren't figure skaters. They didn't do that. But roller skating was their their thing. Everything changed when I put the uh, roller skating floor up there because the children spent a lot of time up there. She got to know them. And there was always a lot of laughter, giggling. and So I think that she liked it. And then the sounds that I heard were some laughter, very light, and she'll walk around, but it's not that fear, fearful walking. When she saw that we weren't a threat, we weren't gonna destroy the home, I think that she just enjoyed that lifestyle. You know, watching children grow up in the home that she designed and built. I think that she became happy and we like having her around, we really do. Just last week, we, uh, I was leaving for dinner with a, uh, a date and we started to pull away and the lights in the attic just went on. And he said, oh, somebody just went up your attic. I said, yeah. <laughs> it's par part of our lives and we're not afraid and uh, we would miss it if it didn't happen, I think. Next people coming in after me are gonna have one hell of a time. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> me and Sonia. <laughs> I've always been very open, you know, ever since I was a little kid and before this experience, I definitely believed that there was something uh, bigger than us, you know, outside of this sort of realm. I was about 19, and I was living in Los Angeles in a house with my mom and my sister. I had met with the director for a movie that he had actually always sort of thought about me for this part. And 
in, in reading it, I loved it right away. It was a horror movie and I went to this meeting and it was actually not an audition. I was just going to meet with him and talk to him about the script. My connection with Joe was a special scenario. I got there and the conversation was really easy. Those meetings are sometimes uncomfortable. You know, you're, you're meeting with somebody that you don't know and you have to kind of find things to talk about. We sort of had this strange instant connection right away. I, I just knew that it was gonna be great and I left the meeting. I knew he wanted to work with me. I knew I wanted to work with him. And the movie was supposed to start filming a few months later. So that night, I go to sleep on what seemed like a regular night. And one of my girlfriends was spending the night, so she's sleeping over here. And I wake up about 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning. Instantly, I see I go to sleep on what seemed like a regular night, and one of my girlfriends was spending the night, so she's sleeping over here, and I wake up about 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning. Instantly, I see a woman standing at the foot of my bed. She's about 5'6 or 5'7. She's in her 30s, and she was dressed in red and yellow, like sort of draped over her shoulders. As I'm looking at her, I, I realize that I can see myself from three different perspectives. I can see myself from the top right corner of the room, from lying down, and my legs are straight out, but I could also see myself sitting up at the same time out of my body. I think she was holding my feet down, kind of like keeping me in, in my body, so to speak. She's holding my feet. And so, you know, it sounds like it would maybe be intimidating or, or scary, you know, but it wasn't, she was caring. It felt like a grounding and a comfort. I don't really know how I knew she was, uh, she was Buddhist. I, I, it was just a feeling that I just knew in looking at her. She was there for, it felt like minutes, but I think it was probably only about 30 seconds that I actually saw her. My friend woke up a few seconds after that. I was shaking and my foot was like hitting her foot. She's, she's like, as if it wasn't even me, I said, I think Joe just died. She, she's like, Joe, you know, who, who are you talking about? And I said it again. Joe just died. She's like, you know, you're, you're crazy. Just go back to sleep. And so I went back to sleep. I wake up the next morning, and I get up like around 9.30 in the morning, something like that. And my mom and my sister are there. I tell them about the woman and how she's a Buddhist. How I, I woke up knowing that somebody had died. It sort of registers with everybody, and everyone's kind of like, wow, that's kind of intense. Right away, I get a phone call from Joe's producing partner. She says, Haley, you know, is this a, a good time to talk? Do you have a minute? I have something I need to tell you. And I think I already knew what she was gonna say. She's like, well, I was calling because I wanted to let you know that last night around 3.30 in the morning, Joe passed away and he had died of a heart attack in the middle of the night. My, my heart drops. Oh my God. What, is there anything I can do? 
I find out about Joe's mom and, you know, where to send flowers to her. And I ask about funeral arrangements and, you know, if I can do something or help. Shortly after that, she tells me that she's not sure what the process will be for his funeral arrangements because Joe was a Buddhist. It was, it was definitely um, a lot for me to process, obviously because of losing somebody that was as wonderful as he was. And looking at my mom and her knowing what I was hearing on the, on the other end of the phone and it being so still in the house, Right after hanging up the phone uh, with Joe's partner, I instantly, my mind's like going 100 miles an hour and I'm trying to figure out why, why me? Why did she come to me? What, what do each of these sort of memories that stuck out out of this experience really mean? And, you know, after, after thinking about it and, and spending some time just with the memory especially. I think she was Joe. And I think maybe he just knew that I was a safe person maybe to come to when he passed over. I think he appeared in this other form to be his the most comforting to me he could be. I, I just sort of look at it as you know, his way of, of telling me goodbye. Celebrity ghost stories. If walls could absorb extraordinary presences or experiences, this house had it going on. A friend of mine died in my bed. I mean, I was just paralyzed. I was maybe 10 years old and I was at a summer camp. The campfire kind of came to an end, and it's pitch dark, and I mean really pitch dark. You just realized how far away you were from your parents, from safety. I could barely stand the thought of going on without him in my life. One day, I asked him, after you pass over, would you try to contact me? Get me a message. It was about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. The minute I realized what I was looking at, it freaked me out. It was one of those things where you just kind of like, you know, somebody else is here. I think that there was ghosts in the house that I live in, because I live in a very old house. <laughs> Betty Davis lived there. She bought it from the man who played the ship captain in King Kong, and I think he passed there. You know, if walls could absorb extraordinary, you know, presences or experiences or whatever, this house had it going on that way. A friend of mine uh, named Greg Stevens, he was a gay friend of mine, a Republican gay. I mean, the combination of what he was is a Republican gay drug addict, which is an unusual combination, I think. But he was a lot of fun, which was surprising given what I normally think may be a Republican would be in terms of fun. His family lived in LA, but he was at odds with his family. So my house was his home. So what happened was Greg came out here uh, for the Academy Awards exactly almost four years ago. 
because he wanted to go to all the parties. He arrived on a Friday, um, went to a party with us. I went home earlier than he did. Then he came back afterwards, and he had brought with him his uh, assistant friend, Judy. He slept with me because I wasn't going to sleep with Judy, and Judy slept in um, my guest room where he would normally sleep. So this was the first time he'd ever, uh, he'd ever slept in my bed. And it was the last time he ever slept in my bed. I woke up and then I went over. Get up, Greg! And Wake up, Greg! Was banging Greg. on him. Wake up! Wake up, Greg! Greg died uh, in my bed that night. It was horrible. I called 911, but by then I was just, <laughs> I mean, I was just paralyzed. I blame myself for his death because it happened on my watch. And, you know, I thought if I woke up that it wouldn't have happened. But it happened. So after a while in the house, um, there was this really strong sense of a presence in the house. It was like it was um, just heavier, just kind of, you know, that there was something in the house. So that I would come home and say, hi, Greg, I'm back. I mean, it was just really odd it was just this like you'd walk in the air and there was something liquid about it almost you know like you were just moving through this aura or something very soon after that noises i mean vivid noises i had was dating someone for a minute. I told him about the noises and he just thought that was absurd. Something was making a noise that there had, had no business making. And I had said to him, Greg is following me. And he didn't believe me and then this happened and he was sort of freaked out. So it wasn't just me that felt it by any means. One night, um, I was in my room, the room that uh, Greg had died in, and I was, it was very, very late at night, and I was writing, and I, I had this um, gag toy. I had used it many years before when I was doing a, a, writing one of the young indies with George Lucas, and we both had them, and you'd push the button on it, and it would, it would just say awful things to you. You're a Eat Eat Are you You're talking to me? me? And I'd left it in the room next to mine, my closet, where Greg had left many of his clothes. And through the wall, I heard, which really scared me. Um, and 
I didn't want to go in there and look for the toy or, you know. I stayed in the room and I uh, sort of calmed down and it happened again. And I was quite frightened by this, but I just, it, I knew it was Greg. Both times the little toy said, are you talking to me? <laughs> A friend of mine named Greg died in my bed. Wake up, wake up, Greg. There was this really strong sense of a presence in the house. One night, I was in my room. I had this gag toy, and you'd push the button on it, and it would just say awful things to you. I'd left it in the room next to mine, where Greg had left many of his clothes. And through the wall, I heard, Stop it. That is not funny. Out of all the little things that it could have said, the one thing that the machine, the little toy had said was, basically, are you communicating with me? My editor of my book, I told her about it, and she said, well, maybe I should talk to the psychic. And, um, this wasn't something I did commonly, but anyway, she put me in touch with this woman. And I talked to her, and I, I was crying. Anyway, she said that he was pulled out of life so abruptly, and he was, you know, in his 40s, he was quite young, so that she felt that he was in distress, partly. I mean, just that he did not accept leaving and that part of him, yes, was in the house and even part of him was trying to sort of enter me in a way, because sort of my distress was his, was a manifestation of his distress. seemed like sort of a natural thing that he wouldn't want to leave because he was planning in a, on being settled there. And so in a way, he did settle there for a while after he died. I didn't think it was a bad thing. Like, I, it wasn't like I would come and <laughs> have an exorcist or something come and make him get out. It was completely okay with me. I think it makes sense to stay around where you're comfortable, stay around those that you love until, you know, you can accept things and, and move on. You know, when I was a little boy, I, I was too cool to believe in ghosts, but, but I thought I was, at least, um, even when I was a kid. And so, but one thing happened to me once that I have never been able to really explain. It was in the late 50s, I was maybe 10, 12 years old, and I was at a summer camp called Happy Hollow. Happy Hollow was mostly where they went and played sports and went swimming and everything. But there were some campers, only about 20, who spent the night, and uh, there were three cabins. 
At this time, I thought I was really cool. I wanted to be Elvis Presley. I listened to black radio stations. I really thought I was a hep cat. And I had one counselor named Robin that we sort of befriended, and it was kind of, I looked up to him, kind of like hero worship. I think in, in the beginning, I looked up to this, this counselor as all like 10-year-old boys do, but maybe I looked up to him a little more. He was handsome too, and he was cool, and, but, but it wasn't sexually, it wasn't anything like that. Once a year, they had, for the overnight campers, a hike, an overnight hike. And it was something that you look forward to every year. And um, we went, all, th all three cabins went, all the ages, from about six years old to 12. You guys ready? Yeah. And we had our whole kits with us, our sleeping bags, our canteen with water, our flashlights. And we started the hike through the woods, past the swimming pool, the, the route that we knew. But we kept going deeper and deeper into the woods. We had never been this far because we only got to do it once a year. And uh, we kept walking. It started getting darker. It was really quite beautiful in a way and exciting. We really felt like we were on this adventure. And we were with the three, three counselors. And, uh, and we got deeper and deeper in the woods. It started getting darker and darker. We finally got to this place that obviously the counselors had decided we would camp. And it was just like a clearing kind of in the woods, but it was deep in the woods. We had been taught in camp how to build a campfire, so we did all that. We're uh, roasting hot dogs, we're uh, doing marshmallows, doing the whole thing. And after we eat, everybody's kind of sitting around on their, on their sleeping bag. It starts getting darker and darker, and, and the campfire comes down and down. There gets, you know, flickering, kindling left. And, and um, Robin starts telling ghost stories. And this one ghost story he started telling was basically the soul of the ghost of, of Billy Whitehead. It was a story about how this one camper had vanished and he died on one of these hikes. <laughs> they had covered it up and said he had drowned when we went looking for crayfish, which was something we did in nature course. Every year, his spirit would cry out to the other kids that came on this hike every year to hear him, to notice him, that his spirit was still there. Well, I thought, bull crap. I didn't believe that for one minute, but I listened to the story as, as Robin told it and kind of rolled my eyes and looked at him. And as the story ended, it got dark, the campfire kind of came to an end, and they said, time to go to bed. So everybody gets in their little sleeping bags, and it's really dark, and everybody's finally quiet. The lights, the campfire's gone, and it's pitch dark, and I mean really pitch dark. Silence. Everybody's trying to go to sleep, but there is no silence in the woods in the middle of the night. You just realized how far away you were from your parents, from safety. So everybody's silent for a long time, trying to go to sleep. And then you hear one of the middle kids call out for Joe, who was the, another counselor who was kind of square. We made fun of him. He liked Pat Boone and stuff. Joe, where are you? But he didn't answer. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird. And then another camper yelled out for Kevin, one of the other counselors. He didn't answer either. There was more silence, and then an older one, not myself, but another per person yelled out for Robin. He didn't answer. And there was more and more silence, longer and longer. One of the younger kids started freaking out a little bit, saying, where are the counselors? They were there to protect us. They, they were supposed to be our guards. If there was anything in the woods, we wanted the counselors to help us. And then we heard this noise, and we saw in the distance, some kind of light running through the woods. And there was more noise, like weird, weird, kind of devilish, kind of scary noises. And we saw another light in a, diff in a different one. And it was kind of in a different direction, but it was like sort of running with it. And then there'd be a noise over here. So the kids are going like this and looking over there, saying, look over there, and then they wouldn't see it, and they'd look over there. So they'd look in different directions, but nobody was quite sure. Nothing was on long enough where all the kids at the same time could look at it. And then we heard this thud right in the camp. 
And the kids freaked out. Some of the little kids started crying then, and everybody's in their sleeping bag. Nobody got out. That's when the terror was at the peak. Maybe the ghost of the killer had grabbed the counselors. Maybe they had been dragged off. Nobody knew, really. I was maybe 10, 12 years old, and I was at a summer camp called Happy Hollow. Once a year, they had an overnight hike. It got dark, the campfire kind of came to an end, and they said, time to go to bed. So everybody gets in their little sleeping bags, and it's pitch dark. <laughs> One of the younger kids started freaking out a little bit, saying, where are the counselors? And everybody's in their sleeping bag, nobody got out. That's when the terror was at the peak. I hear this movement in the distance, and I hear the noise, but I recognize the voice. It's Robin. They're caught. In my mind, my fear level goes to zero. And I yell out, it's the counselors. So I get out, and I go over to where this thud was, and I find what was the thud, and it was just basically a canteen thing filled with leftover trash from the uh, cookout that one of the counselors had thrown. So I go out, kids start throwing stuff back. They know that the counselors are out there now. So I go into the, not into the woods, so it's not that far, and it's pitch dark still, so you can't really see where you're going. I go in a little further because I'm looking for Robin, because I'm mad at Robin. Why didn't you include me in this? I could have been good, you know? I could have made him even more frightened, I guess. And I go into the woods, and I see this thing that is completely different. It is obviously not a flashlight, and it is not Robin, and it has no, no form, really, but it's, it's a white light, and it zooms down. And it was very quick. I realized this was not the counselors. This was something that I've never seen before, ever in my life. It was a face, and it was a face of an older man. And it has an odor, an, uh, oddly an odor of powdered sugar. It looked at me, and I saw an older man's face, and it was familiar. It wasn't hostile, and it looked at me kind of understandingly, but I, I should have been screaming. I, I don't know why I wasn't like completely freaked out by it. I, I froze and looked at it in wonderment, certainly, in an excitement. I mean, I was raised a Catholic, so was this a guardian angel? I believe in the basic goodness of people, but people that are, that are maybe mean-spirited, which some of these counselors were, um, don't have that guardian angel. It weirdly brought a calmness to me. And then is when I saw Robin, the counselor, and I saw a look of terror on his face. Suddenly, the teeth popped out, one by one. Not all of them, but like bang, 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 like that. And he was freaked, and he felt terror. I didn't feel terror, and I kind of knew that I would never be frightened of anything again. But when I looked in Robin's face, I knew that he would never not be afraid. It just kind of came, happened, came into focus, hovered, and was gone. Well, we went back to the camp, you know, the next day everybody got up, nobody mentioned it. Uh, none of the kids went home and snitched about what, happened, what these counselors did to us. But when it was over, our relationship was over in a way. He wouldn't look at me because I had seen the fear in his eye. Now, did that lessen his power over me? Did that lessen, um, I think we should have bonded with that in a way. It was sad to me. It's the kind of thing, you know, a lot of people have things that happen where you don't talk about it. You just keep it as your little thing. I never saw him again, ever, ever, after camp either. It was a wonderful lesson for me as a 10-year-old kid that I think helped me become whatever I am today. It gave me the confidence to go ahead, to believe in things, to believe and behavior I couldn't understand, to be drawn to subject matter that I couldn't understand. And I felt safe with that spirit or whatever it was. It made me feel more confident and, and inside and included, something that uh, maybe I had never felt before that night. And I did feel like that probably for the rest of my life. I met Rill when I was 10 years old as was he, uh, fourth grade. 
and we stayed friends all his life. We had a very special relationship. We had been through thick and thin with each other. You know, a friendship like that just doesn't break. I developed a feeling for him that was almost, he was my touchstone, I used to say. He's the one I went to with everything. We met Christina in college, and the three of us wound up living in Los Angeles. And for years, you know, we were kind of a trio, but Real and I were really closer. All my marriages and divorces, he was there. Real got sick, and uh, this was just a few years ago. The disease that Real had is called for short PSP, which is progressive supranuclear palsy. It's memory loss, and then finally motor loss. We've been together oh so long, as friends, you know. I could barely stand the thought of going on without him in my life. I didn't really believe in an afterlife, and neither did he, and neither did Christina. But one day when he and I were alone together, he could no longer talk, but he was alert. And I was holding his hand, but I, I just couldn't let him go. And I asked him, I said, you know, just for fun, after you pass over, would you try to contact me? If there's any way. Get me a message. He squeezed my hand and I said, you know, we always used to play with your chemistry set when we were kids and we always used to do experiments and Let's do something along that line. How about electricity? Use electricity in some way. I don't know why I thought of electricity. It seemed somehow the natural thing to go to. The night he died, he was living in his mother's house and I was there and Christina was there and we couldn't tell if he was breathing or not. We kept checking and he'd gone. I spent the night there with his mother and Christina went home. His mother and I got up and uh, we ended up in the kitchen at about the same moment, and she turned on the recessed lights. There were nine bulbs in that recessed light, big bulbs. They went on and then out like that. And she said, that never happens. They burn out one at a time. I replaced them, but they never all go out at once. Well, I didn't tell her about his promise to me to contact me electrically because I thought it was a, some kind of coincidence. So I went into the office and I emailed Christina. And uh, how are you doing? Well, when I started talking about real, I met real when I was 10 years old. We had a very special relationship. Real got sick. Then he'd gone. I spent the night there with his mother. 
His mother and I got up. And she turned on the recessed lights and then... Well, I didn't tell her about his promise to me to contact me electrically. So I went into the office and I emailed Christina. But when I started talking about real, the screen got static key, like a television screen does, black. I thought, well, I've never seen that happen before <laughs> on a personal computer. So I went to the telephone and called her. And I said, how are you doing? And are you making it OK? And she said, yes, but I didn't get much sleep. The strangest thing happened. When I got home last night, she said, I know it was late, but I went into the kitchen. And I, I turned on the recessed lights. <laughs> and all 20 of them snapped out at once. So I remember being startled and thrilled because I thought, could it be? So I started to tell her about the promise that Real had made me, but the moment I started talking about Real, the telephone went dead to a sound of almost a busy signal sound, except it was constant. And I said, do you think you could come over here in person? Because I'll never get it said on the phone. So she came over, and I told her about the promise he'd made me that he would Oh dear, that he would contact me electrically. I think definitely this was his style. He was an imaginative person. And also playful. It was about a week and a half after he died in his room, and I was clearing out things he'd kept. I was feeling nostalgic. Oh, here I have my hands on his things. And I just looked up over my shoulder into the living room. And he was there, sitting there, grinning, a great big grin at me. Except for being in the wheelchair, he looked like he looked for years. He didn't look sick. And he said, hey, it's no big deal. Hey, it's no big deal. It was a reassurance. What that meant to me was his passing over was no big deal. I shouldn't feel the loss of him. I shouldn't suffer that he's not with me. It gave me the impression that he meant it's all one thing. It's all one thing. This is no big deal. This is just a little minor change. It was very comforting. It was also very amusing because it was so like him. Hey, it's no big deal, you know? <sighs> so it's hard not to believe in an afterlife after that. Catholic environment. Not overly religious, but 
I remember uh, when, when I was growing up, there were images of saints and, you know, Madonnas and everything uh, kind of related to religion. So, you know, these, these things, these uh, supernatural things or these, like, I don't know what you want to call it, ghosts or whatever, uh, if I can't see it, I, I don't know if I will believe it. So I'm always skeptical about it. Besides being an actor, um, a painter as well. Painting uh, is something that uh, is very close to me. Uh, it's very, very, very personal. A lot more so than acting. There was a time where I, uh, I got a large commission, a large painting commission, which I had to do, which was a painting that was about uh, 30 feet long by you know six and a half feet high. At the time, uh, my studio wasn't big enough uh, where I was painting, and I needed to find a, uh, a larger studio so I can actually, you know, do these uh, these two large paintings. I called on a very good friend of mine who uh, worked with uh, uh, a Catholic school in uh, Madison, New Jersey. He said, you know, there is a, there is a large space in uh, in this mansion that isn't you know, isn't being used. I mean, there's uh, there's no one that lives there. There's a Catholic priest, just one person who lives all the way upstairs. Uh, when I arrived on the grounds, uh, it was humongous. As we walked in uh, and I saw the space, I said, this, this, this space will definitely be appropriate. The light is perfect. I can, you know, I can utilize this as a studio. It had tall ceilings. Uh, there was a fireplace there. Then there was another door that kind of was always shut because it went into this next room and it was always locked. I had met Father Ed Dillon, who was the priest that lived upstairs. And Father, uh, Father Ed uh, just came in and kind of took a look around my studio and uh, we chatted for a little bit and uh, you know, he seemed like a nice enough priest. The place is kind of kind of creepy. I mean, like you know, there's there's no two two ways about it. There is kind of like a, a strange feeling, but you know, I'm there for a purpose. I, I need a studio to paint, and I would paint like incessantly. I mean, once I start painting, I'm kind of like in a different frame of mind, like almost like an alpha state. I'm just there. I'm painting. I have my music on, and I'm just focused on what I'm doing, you know, thinking about so many different things and, and just painting and going and so many hours go by and you don't even realize it. When you are painting, I believe you're kind of an open vessel. Your, your thoughts are free, you're, you know, you're kind of like in a different state of mind. I think a lot of things come into you. This one particular night, uh, it was about, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. And I was doing a very detailed section, very focused. And I was standing up at the time, and my, my arm was up like this. And I remember the doorway was, was to my right. Uh, I, felt, I felt like a presence. I felt something. And I, from the corner of my eye, I saw something. Right as my, my brain realized that there's somebody there, I turned around, and sure enough, there was somebody looking at me. I locked eyes with this young girl, a little girl. Painting uh, is something that uh, is very close to me. Uh, it's very, very, very personal, a lot more so than acting. There was a time where I, uh, I got a large painting commission. At the time, uh, my studio wasn't big enough uh, where I was painting, and I needed to find a, uh, a larger studio. The place is kind of, 
kind of creepy. I mean, like, you know, there's, there's no two, two ways about it. There is kind of like a, a strange feeling, but, you know, I'm there for a purpose. I, I need a studio to paint. This one particular night, I was doing a very detailed section, very focused. From the corner of my eye, I saw something. Right as my, my brain realized that there's somebody there, I turned around, and sure enough, there was somebody looking at me. I locked eyes with this young girl, a little girl. And as the minute I realized what I was looking at, the head went back into the hallway. And I said, hello, I, I, is someone there? <laughs> I just went right to the, right to the doorway, and this is a few steps away, and uh, kind of basically peeked out. And I, there, were, there were no footsteps, no, nothing that I, I could see. And it was just too quick for anybody to get anywhere. And that's what, that's what freaked me out. And I just felt like, I, I felt uncomfortable. And uh, was a little uh, kind of like apprehensive to even leave that night. But, you know, I had to go back down the stairs, you know, to the front door, unlock the front door, and then, you know, go out to the car. It was like, it was one of those things where you just kind of like, you know, somebody else is here. A couple of days later, it's, it, was in, it was on my mind. I wound up running into uh, Father Ed Dillon, who was the priest that lived upstairs. And I said, Father, I said, it was very strange. I, there was someone there. And he said, oh, so you've met her. I said, I, I didn't know that there was anybody else that lived here. And uh, he said, no, no, no. He goes, you've, you've met Alice. And I said, well, who's, who's Alice? He said, well, she is. Uh, she was a young, uh, young girl, maybe about uh, 10, 10 or 12 years old, something like that. She was um, the daughter of the owner of the house at the time. And uh, there was a fire that occurred in the house. And this, this little girl perished in this fire in the room next door to my studio. Well, I don't know if you can see this, but my, my hair is standing on end again right now. When he told me this, uh, I was, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. I, I, everything that, uh, I, I, that was a, sort of like the last thing that I was ready to hear. There were several accounts where there were uh, nuns, a few nuns that lived in the convent. They had witnessed this young girl, um, near the chapel area. <laughs> Although the feeling when, when, I, when she was looking at me was not a feeling of like, you know, like anything, uh, it wasn't a menacing feeling or anything like that. It was just kind of uh, maybe somebody looking in and being curious. I think that uh, if no one had been in that room for many, many years, and now I'm in there, and there's music playing, and you know, I'm working on a painting. My mind is, you know, focused. She could have been curious to come in and see what was going on. All I know is that uh, that this this person is still there. This 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 uh, young person, this little girl, is still kind of in transition or whatever you want to call it, but she's still around. I, you know, I'm, I'm an eyewitness for this. This is, uh, it, uh, it definitely affected the time of me working there overnight after that. I'm like 6'1", 220 pounds, learned martial arts. I'm not afraid of many things, but this freaked me out kind of being a skeptic all these years, um, kind of made it a reality for me. Uh, <laughs> I'm a believer now. I mean, I, I can't, uh, I know there's something else out there that, that is uh, inexplicable, and uh, you really just can't put your finger on it, you know? Celebrity ghost stories. I had finally decided to write a book. 
there was always this sense of, I wasn't alone. Footsteps, laughing. I was definitely freaked out. I saw a person and I said, who's here? He said, no one. The moment of confrontation was, was unsettling. What am I seeing? What should I do? The building was filled with sort of eccentric older people. It's kind of like great expectations. Things sort of progressively started to get strange. I hear heavy walking, something like dragging. My downstairs neighbor, she says, who's in your apartment? Just don't go up there. My space was being invaded. A lot of it is hoping that your child doesn't see it. It's not like I could just turn around and move out. I got chills because this ghost was trying to get close to my daughter. So as a child, I was always very sensitive to energies of a place. I would go in and feel something, and I'd have to leave. It would just be like, I'm not comfortable, we have to leave here. So I live by the beach in Los Angeles. Very easygoing, casual, always a breeze. I had finally decided to write a book. And I found that I wasn't so comfortable doing it in my home, that I wanted to actually feel like I was going to work and going to write somewhere. So I asked my friend Gray, who she and I do Scooby-Doo together. We're voiceover actresses. And the last year or so, she had talked about her recent purchase of this apartment. She wanted an apartment to use as sort of a, a place for her out-of-town guests. And as soon as she said that, and I knew that I was gonna be writing the book, it sort of made sense to me to ask her if I could use it. It's unoccupied most of the time, so I thought it would be a great place to write a book. Really was just gonna be a couple days a week for about two months. This building is just such a unique, old, stately, gorgeous place. It's one of the oldest buildings in Southern California, Los Angeles area. It still has so much character, and it's still just absolutely old Hollywood glamour. It became a Hollywood institution in that they filmed some movies there. Um, they filmed The Sting there. David Lynch, who actually was a resident for a while, filmed Wild at Heart there with Laura Dern. Tim Burton took residence there for a while. So it does have quite a history of being a part of the fabric of Hollywood. What was interesting and what I wasn't used to were the sounds of the building. Always heard things, squeaks, floorboards. There was always this sense of I wasn't alone. The building talks, and so her apartment in and of itself always had a certain feeling. After a couple days of writing the book, I'm alone in the apartment. And I heard the door jiggling. Someone was handling the doorknob in some way to open it. And I called out Gray's name because I assumed Gray decided to come and get something. Gray? Gray? No one was there. It was, it was very strange. That was the first time something odd happened to me while I was there. Having been there for a few weeks already, I was used to 
driving underground. Obviously, I park in gray space. There's not really a lot of hustle and bustle down there. So you're not used to really seeing anybody. And I heard footsteps <laughs> laughing. I call for the elevator. And I saw a young boy watching me. He has these kind of dark brown trousers on, Oxford shirt with kind of this plaid print, belted. Young, very young, six or seven years old. Doesn't seem lost, doesn't wander around. And he was gone. It was this sense of someone's down here with me. Okay, now I'm alone down here. That's kind of what, what it felt like. So another riding day, I drive into the subterranean garage, park my car, walk and call the elevator, and the elevator door opens. The elevator is one, if not the oldest elevators in Los Angeles. It's gilded, it's iron, and its integrity is intact. So you get in and you basically go into a cage. I'm alone in the elevator. And I remember my phone ringing. I have to put down my sack lunch and reach into my purse to get my phone. Hello? I look up and there's a man in the elevator with me. I mean, he was standing there behind me. I remember my heart dropping. I mean, it's definitely like there's some guy in the elevator with me and I didn't hear him get on. He had this alabaster skin, very groomed, everything crisp, clean, and of a different time. He didn't say anything, he didn't move, he was not communicating with me. He was just on the elevator. I was answering my phone and said to my friend Amy, I gotta call you back. He was gone. We arrived at the third floor and I, I got my stuff and walked out. It, it was just startling, first of all, just to see someone in the elevator when you expect to be alone. And at the same time, someone obviously of a different time. I immediately called Gray and said, I just saw a man in the elevator. And she said, oh yeah, I've totally seen him. Excuse me? I immediately called Gray and said, I just saw a man in the elevator. And she said, oh yeah, I've totally seen him. Excuse me? She then proceeded to describe him to a T. This is before me even saying what he was wearing. It was very apparent that I was not the only one who had seen what I had seen. Apparently every resident has seen this gentleman. He is seen and has been seen for many, many, many years. I had to ask Gray. There was a boy in the garage and she absolutely knew exactly what I was talking about instantaneously. And she said, that's the custodian's son. He was the son of the custodian who used to live on site in the early 1900s. His apartment was down there, his office was down there, tools down there, and he lived there with his young son. Apparently when the elevator was being tested, One of the cables snapped and the elevator fell three flights and apparently smashed the boy and the boy was instantly killed.
Since then, for the last hundred years, this boy has been living down in the garage, which for him is the basement and where he lived. The custodian who used to live on site is the man in the elevator. That's the story. It was just crazy, otherworldly. After hearing that story, I was definitely freaked out. I don't know whether people or spirits or energy gets trapped. I don't know, but they are sticking around. So I was kind of finished being at Gray's apartment. It really stopped being about a, the place where Mindy goes to write. So the book wasn't on hold, but it was sort of, I can't write there anymore, that's for sure. I was about early 20s, about 23, when I, I had the encounter. I was uh, hoping that something would be revealed to me, telling me my path in life. But I must say that the moment of confrontation was, was unsettling. Makes you question yourself, your vision, your mental capacity. I was living in New York at the time, working as a dancer on Broadway. I had fulfilled an early dream. I started auditioning when I was around 18 or so. First Radio City Music Hall, and I was dancing on my toes. At those, in those days at Radio City Music Hall, they had what they called the corps de ballet or the ballet girls. But the Rockettes, who were in tap shoes and kicked and are famous to this day, they were the main event. And I, that was my first professional job in the theater. Working in Broadway shows to make money and support myself, and we didn't make a lot of money in those days. Maybe we started at like $76 a week for eight shows. This was my livelihood. But I had my eye on acting. And I was still trying to act and going out for things and failing. I couldn't even get arrested for a commercial. You'd go back maybe six or seven times. When I would go up for acting roles, they'd say, oh, she's a dancer. She probably can't act. At this time, I met my friend, uh, Gene Verone, in Take Me Along. He was a wonderful singer, and uh, he'd been an actor, but he had this gorgeous tenor voice. From that moment till the day he died, we were best friends. So long about the mid-60s, Gene and I were fast friends. I was in his apartment, and he had the most glorious apartment. And we were sitting one night in his apartment, as we did lots of times. We'd had dinner, we were laughing, listening, and he was, uh, we played um, classical music a lot. And it was around a time where I had a, was facing a decision. I was offered by the wonderful choreographer, Michael Kidd, who I worked for in Little Abner. I did another show of his called um, Wildcat with Lucille Ball. He offered me a show called Here's Love. I said, Val, come and dance in the chorus. And I was talking with Gene, what should I do? How can I turn down work? How can anyone trying to make their rent, living in New York and being in the theater, maybe it's just as well I take this job and continuing my acting classes? Or is it better to say, I wanna try acting full time, real, do I do this or do I do that? I think I'm just having a hard time imagining myself. And we're sitting in two armchairs, see this beautiful living room, and then there was a door to his bedroom. And he was facing me, and I was facing a door, and we're chatting. You know, I really want to try something really good, but I'm imagining myself doing something. And I saw. A person, a figure, just 
standing profile in the doorway. And I said, who's here? He said, no one, I said, just us. I said, well, look, and he looked. He said, oh my God. He said, yes, yeah. who's there? And there was no answer. It was very unsettling in that there's only one door in. He had been in the bedroom. I had been there all evening. And how someone could have gotten in, I guess in that moment of, who's that? And then you say, ooh, maybe it's not a person. If it's not a person, what am I seeing? We knew something was going on. It was all kind of misty and mysterious and a cool light around her. She was in blue, a beautiful period, a century and a half ago outfit with a matching bonnet. She was of means and elegance. She stood right in the doorway and turned and looked at us. There's a moment that when things, when somebody says something horribly embarrassing at a gathering and it just freezes the room, that was the feeling. It's like, what next? There's a moment when somebody says something horribly embarrassing at a gathering and it just freezes the room, that was the feeling. It's like, what next? She was letting us know that she saw us, and she probably was telling me to do something, but I didn't know what to do. I felt very, very just odd. I remember her being very dignified and very centered. She radiated confidence and sense of direction, and I sure didn't have it at the moment. I was scared. She looked over in our direction, and she calmly gathered herself and walked off. But where she walked was into his closet. And the closet door was closed. And uh, with trepidation, we opened the door. There was no one there. And I must say, I, I was terrified. And I said, oh my gosh, you know, where do you think she came from? And I said, I wonder why? Was this some kind of sign, do you think, or a message? I said, you know, this is an old building. Maybe it was someone that was here. And he said, yeah, I'm gonna look into it. And he did. He went to the building authority and uh, checked on what was the story with this beautiful building. What he found out was wonderful. Uh, first of all, uh, immediately that our lady in blue was not walking into a closet, that that closet door had not originally been a closet. Because the building had been subdivided into apartments, originally that door led to the outside entrance. In other words, that was an exit and he found out that it was the built for the Astors. Now, John Jacob Astor was the very first, the very first multimillionaire in America. His wife was Sarah Todd Astor, who was an extraordinary patron of the arts. They gave all kinds of money and gave parties and balls and entertained the performers of the day. And this woman we saw was very elegant and extremely well-dressed and poised. I have, and she, that was her house. I have seen a picture of uh, Sarah Todd Astor. And when I saw her picture, I thought, oh gee, absolutely. I've got to think that this wonderful patron of the arts, the performing arts, was Sarah Todd Astor. And here this occurred at a time when I was having to make a decision. And here was Sarah saying, watch how it's done. And I took that to um, mean that I should em embark, take a new direction, give myself a chance. And I, 
uh, full bore on acting jobs. And it's been good to me. <laughs> it was a good move. So I thank you to the lady in blue. I, as a child, was the most frightened and timid human on earth. I actually slept in front of my parents' door to, to an embarrassing age. I think it was like 12. I was so scared of everything. I was scared of like monsters and sort of things under my bed and that would sort of freak me out. About seven years ago, I uh, had just graduated from, from film school and I was living in, in New York City. And I, on a whim, sort of came out to Los Angeles and maybe if I could, I would try to find a place to live for like a month to sort of feel out the uh, directing options in Los Angeles. Three hours before I was supposed to leave, I was driving around Hollywood. I'm a, I'm a big fan of history, and especially old Hollywood and these sort of old buildings they have over there. And I found one that sort of stuck out. And I thought, if they have an opening, I'll s stay for a little while, for a month. And as I was getting out of my car, I looked, and it was this kind of uh, eerily decrepit, but beautiful, old, it's kind of like great expectations. It had a, an air of, of history to it, which I responded to. Went up to the door, and I looked through, and I saw they had a vacancy. and. I rang the bell, the landlady got on the speaker and I said, oh, you know, I hear there's a vacancy, I'm sort of, can I check it out? And she says, oh, you know, come, you know, come back, back tomorrow, because it was a Sunday, actually. And I said, okay, and I went to turn, and then the intercom came back to life. Wait, are you downstairs? And I said, yes. And she said, uh, wait right there, actually. I was gonna just walk away, fly back to New York, and sort of forget about LA. She comes down, I go in, I look around. Immediately, I'm sort of enchanted with this place. Within 10 minutes, I sign a lease, and she was very kind in giving me a month lease, and I just, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it all kind of fell into place. And then following that, I, I moved to the building. All of Hollywood at that time had a, a dirty vibrance. Uh, the building was filled with sort of eccentric older people. Mostly in their 60s and 70s. Again, a sort of, uh, surreal air about them. And there was a woman that would only wear purple. She had these like beautiful purple gowns and like that building, everyone was sort of out of place. Sort of, you know, eccentric older people. In talking to Connie, who was the landlady, she said a lot of strange things would happen in that building. It, it definitely had a, an energy. So it, it was a great, it was, it was just great to be in that building. I move into the apartment, and within three days, my agent called and said, Would, you know, there's this pilot, this TV show that they're making. You know, I think it might be good for this particular part. I go on this audition, and pretty much my second audition in my life, I miraculously got the part in this, this TV show. One of the things I would do while waiting for the deal to be signed for the show was wait around in the lobby with the landlady, who became sort of my only friend in Los Angeles. We would kind of hang out in the manager's office and they had this beautiful scrapbook. Uh, the building was built in the 1920s by Paramount to house the actresses that they had under contract. And someone had made this amazing scrapbook with just newspaper article after newspaper article with clippings, stories about the hotel, like old paparazzi things. And there was even like headshots of girls that had lived there. Just sort of all this great old, old interesting stuff. Then things sort of progressively started to get stranger. I sort of out of the blue get cast uh, in this movie that's shooting in Canada. And it's sort of last minute, packed up, was in a hotel room for about two days when my phone lights up. It's a text from Connie, my downstairs neighbor. She says, Matthew, come downstairs, let's, uh, let's watch a movie, which we did quite often. And I was like, oh, yeah, sorry, Connie, I'm in Canada right now. Uh, I'll be back soon, so, whatever. Moment goes by, she texts back, no, seriously, come downstairs, let's watch a movie, uh, anything you wanna watch. And I'm like, no, seriously, I'm in a different country. <laughs> um, I can't come down, you know? 
and pause. She texts back. Well, then who's in your apartment? Matthew, come downstairs. Let's uh, let's watch a movie. I'm in a different country. <laughs> um, I can't come down, you know. And pause. She texts back. Well, then who's in your apartment? I call her up. She's like, "You're not upstairs right now." I'm like, "No." She's like, "You didn't give your keys to anybody? Is, is your your friend? Are your friends?" I'm like, "I don't know anyone in L.A. Like nobody. I know, I know you. you. Like I, no one's there." And she says. Listen to this. She holds up the phone, and I hear heavy walking, something like dragging, and then the sound of like something toppling over. I'm like, Connie, I call the police. I, 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 no one should be up there. She's like, no, I'm going to go up. I'm going to go up. I'm the, I'm the building manager. I have, to, I have to go up and see. I'm like, no, 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 don't go up there. I've literally got, like, there's nothing they could steal. Like, just don't go up there. She keeps me on the phone. She opens the door, which is locked. She enters, the lights are off, looks around. Nothing seems really out of place, except, she says, your desk chair has been kicked over in the corner. It's just sort of an empty closet. The distance, like my desk is pretty far that way, so, um, I chalk it up to like uh, earthquake. It was it was thoroughly disconcerting. So I laugh it off. I come back from shooting. I'm again in the main lobby, looking through this scrapbook, sort of killing time, and I come to a newspaper article from the 1940s and a screenwriter that used to live there in apartment 204 which was where I lived. His name's Harry Stewart, and... He hung himself from the closet. And all of a sudden, I sort of... put it all together, you know, the... The chair, he would have, it would have entailed dragging a chair, putting it in the corner, you know, tying the noose and toppling it over, which is exactly how we found it. That was sort of a, a revelatory moment to think, all of a sudden I had an explanation for what that noise was, and it, it wasn't like the warmest of explanations. And at that point, truthfully, my friends never, never really like stopping by once my friends all moved to LA. Years went by, I always stayed in this apartment, even, you know, basically until three months ago. I've, I've been there for seven years, and I noticed a lot of changes sort of in the building um, over the years, uh, sort of the, the, the life of it that had drawn me to it, the sort of uh, more unique older people with great stories had moved on, or very few of the remaining people still live there, except with the exception of uh, Richard, this man that lived above me on the third floor. Now, Richard, I came to find out, and I was in awe of him, he was a famous historian, Hollywood historian, who made it his mission in life to save old Hollywood buildings, and he'd saved, actually, the building that I lived in. I had a book on Hollywood history, and he was actually thanked in the, in the beginning paragraph, where the old, he collected photos, and just sort of a, a hermit type of guy. The conversations that we had was, you know, about our favorite old buildings and, anyway, he lived above me. We would pass in the hallways and, you know, say hi and I never really saw him talking to many people and I was his friend. And I was going to work, this is about a year ago, and I remember passing in the manager's booth. Uh, whenever somebody in the building did something sort of neat, they would oftentimes, like, put up the articles. And there was this three-page article on, on, on Richard. And I, I didn't get the chance to read it because I was always rushing. And I remember being like, oh, Richard like probably saved another building. I'll have to read that. Anyway, one night I'm coming home, past the manager's office, past the article, didn't stop to read it. It's 3.30 in the morning, maybe. We were shooting nights. I'm going up that staircase. My head's down. And then all of a sudden, I look up and I see Richard descending the stairs. And it's the middle of the night. I didn't expect to see anyone. I'm like, oh, sorry, sorry, Richard, sorry. I didn't see you there. And 
he sort of does this weird thing where he just kind of like, kind of just blank face looks through me and passes me. And I'm like, okay. So I go to my room and I'm like, man, I, th I think Richard's a sleepwalker. But he was also wearing, he had his, you know, he had khakis on and his shirt. He wasn't wearing pajamas or anything. I go to my bed and fall asleep, wake up early the next morning, go downstairs, go to the article. It's Richard's obituary. He died like three days earlier in the building. I don't know, it's so, uh, just thoroughly, uh, I can't explain it, um, shocking, but also sort of touching. It was sort of comforting to know that Richard was still there. And it made perfect sense that he, he would be, you know, he um, fought so hard to keep the building. Sort of that was the last occurrence. So I, sh I left shortly after. I'm uh, very thankful to have lived there. I can't explain why I moved there because it was completely, not only a life-changing moment, but sort of a, um, a serendipitous turn. I feel like the building has a special energy. While it's sad to know that these characters that sort of drew me to the place and that called it home for so long aren't really there anymore, it's very comforting to think that maybe they are. You know, I think it's so important to keep these sort of special places. The, the trend now is to sort of destroy anything that wasn't made in the 90s. And I'm just so happy that it's, that it's still there. I'd always heard stories, people that I knew um, having experiences. And it's not that you don't believe what people are saying, but it's, it's really hard to believe it unless you see it or you experience it yourself. This was my own firsthand experience. I had recently had my daughter, and I had split from her father, and we were we were moving in on our own. The house was, it was old. Everything was original from 1940s, so it had like the beautiful big tile bathrooms, big hardwood floors, big attic. It was great to have a house of my own. A couple months after living there, I was laying in bed. It had to be two, three o'clock in the morning. I woke up hearing footsteps. It sounded like it was in the ceiling, and I wasn't quite sure what it was. The house had, it was all hardwood floors. It was definitely coming from the attic. It was the middle of the night. I wasn't gonna go exploring by myself. It wasn't something I particularly wanted to go investigate. It was creepy because I think deep down inside, I knew that it was footsteps. Could there be somebody up in the attic? After hearing the footsteps during the day, I went up there checking it out for myself. The attic was a great storage place. So I had, you know, my daughter's bassinet and her crib, like the big things. I'm one of those crazy people that thinks everything has a place. I'm one of, I put everything back where it goes, and there was something eerie.
The bassinet had all the, um, the linens on it. This is a baby's bassinet that's, that has all its linens on it now, and I don't know who did that. I didn't do that. It scared the crap out of me, and I thought, there's no way. I wrapped it back up. I put the linens away. I got rid of the bassinet, and I had no interest in going up in the attic again. It, what was once a friendly, clean, nice attic was not anywhere I wanted to go ever again. My space was being invaded. I definitely started to come to the realization that there were probably ghosts living here. It's not like I could just turn around and move out. Um, I wanted it to be OK. So I sort of just thought that it would be better to let it be. I definitely started to come to the realization that there were probably ghosts living here. It's not like I could just turn around and move out. Um, I wanted it to be OK. So I sort of just thought that it would be better to let it be. The bathroom was a big open tile bathroom. I always felt like there was somebody standing right behind me. Um, so much so that it was it would change the way the room sounded. This was something that happened a lot. Well, my greatest fear was that it would start getting closer or start maybe materializing in some sort of way. Like, am I gonna see a face? Am I gonna see, like, a body? Are they gonna try to touch me? A lot of it is hoping that your child doesn't see it. To my knowledge, she was unaware of any kind of activity in the house. My daughter would go visit with her dad occasionally on weekends. He was very kind of preoccupied with himself and his own life. I think she was sort of lonely when she was there. And she was sort of left to entertain herself a lot when she was over there. After a few weekends when she was there, she would come back and she would talk a lot about this really nice lady. And that she lived below. She would always come home and talk about how they played and that um, she was excited because this woman had this, like, beautiful dollhouse. It was just this amazing thing to play with. <laughs> she would talk about the pink carpet in one room. There was a canopy bed in it. There were stairs. There were wooden stairs that led from one floor to another. <laughs> and. I sort of felt like, oh, well, it was good because I felt, um, you know, sort of a, a sense of security that my daughter had a female around while she was over there so that, you know, I felt like she would probably be well taken care of and watched over a little bit better. This is you talking to? My friend. Okay. That's fun. And so I was sort of like relieved that she had made this friend. So she would talk about her, and I, I just didn't really think anything of it. One time during um, a drop-off, I asked her dad, oh, who's the lady that lives downstairs? And he was like, what lady? What that lives downstairs? And I said, the lady who lives in the apartment directly below you. And he said, there's no apartment directly below me. I'm on the first floor. So I said, well, is there somebody in the apartment building, you know, that Dylan goes and plays with? And he said, no. I didn't know what was happening. And then I tried to talk to my daughter about that. She insisted she was older of, like, a grandmother age. And she was very kind. My daughter loved her. She was like, she's the greatest lady. Sweetie, to my friend. But there wasn't. There wasn't a lady there. A couple nights after that, I was in the bathroom, in the sink, washing my hands. My daughter was in bed, 
and just sort of like out of the corner of my eye. It was like something passed me behind me in the mirror. And so I immediately looked up. It looked like a woman, like the hair and a dress. And it was definitely somebody walking past. Like, okay, you can't be like a scared little girl. You're the mom, you're a grown woman. You have to like deal with this. And when I turned the corner and looked, there was nothing, absolutely nothing in there. I looked in my daughter's room. Sound asleep, just passed out. All these things were like confirmations that there was something there. I talked to my neighbor about the house, and she pretty much knew a little bit about everybody on the street. It's sort of a street that people stayed for a long time. And so she began to tell me a little bit about the couple that lived in there. They both died in the home. The husband died first, and then the woman died later. They didn't have any kids, and there were never any grandkids coming to visit or anything like that. And she collected dolls and doll houses. I, I, I didn't really need to hear any more than that. Now that's when the hair on my back stood up and I got chills because there was this woman and maybe she wanted children or grandchildren. For my daughter to go and play with this woman who I later find out doesn't even exist, maybe it was the child she never had or the grandchild she didn't have. <laughs> Making contact and communicating with my daughter um, and not in front of me. I wasn't taking any chances that this ghost was, you know, trying to to get close to my daughter and know my daughter. I couldn't let this shake me and I couldn't let it affect our life. She'd already been through enough. I had been through enough. So we, we had to move at that point. There was a sense of relief to move, but then I thought, is she gonna come with us? Is she gonna find us? I kind of decided to just, to leave it at that, that hopefully she would just stay there you know, I learned how to stand up for things and I had to be a protector and I had to be a provider. And I, I did it all on my own and I took on a lot. 